ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Caitlin Reed. I'm one of the uh, board members for the Selective Mutism Association. And I have a couple of quick announcements before we get into today's content. Um, this webinar is brought to us today by the Selective Mutism Association and was made possible thanks to a generous grant from the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation. Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be available on the Selective Mutism Association's YouTube channel. And we usually are able to post it within the next 24 to 48 hours. A link to this recording will also be sent to all of the registrants uh, later in the week. So you can uh, and absolutely should ask questions through the Q&A um, throughout, the the, throughout the presentation today. Um, I'll be monitoring those and I can um, sort of pare down the ones um, and share those with Dr. Merson um, at the end of today's presentation. And she'll be able to answer a few of those minimally um, today. Um, we do have some upcoming um, additional webinars and a conference to share with you. So the next webinar that we'll be having, which will be on September 14th at 8 p.m. Eastern time, this is for teachers and school-based professionals. So this is entitled Selective Mutism in the Schools, Resources for Supporting Intervention and Collaboration. And this is uh, with Dr. Brittany Weiss-Erbach. And uh, we'll be using our SMA Educator Toolkit as a guide um, for that discussion. And registration is now open for the Selective Mutism Association Annual Conference. This will take place fully virtually on October 2nd and 3rd. We have three tracks this year, one for professionals, one for parents of children with SM, and the third, which is our newest for individuals with selective mutism. And we can link the registration in the, in the chat here as well. All right, my last announcement is, is an introduction. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. Rachel Merson. At Merson. She's the clinical director of the Child and Adolescent Fear and Anxiety Treatment Program at Boston University where she oversees the Selective Mutism Program. She's the president-elect for Selective Mutism Association and has been a member of the board of directors uh, for several years. She's such a wealth of knowledge. I'm excited to introduce you to her today. Dr. Merson, take it away. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And welcome everyone. Thank you for spending your Friday morning with us today. Um, as Caitlin said, my name is Rachel Merson. Um, I'm one of the SMA board members, and I'm also on the faculty at Boston University, um, where I specialize in working with youth with anxiety disorders and especially selective mutism. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about some of the most recent um, selective mutism research. Um, and you know, we all know as professors professionals that it is important to be you know, kind of well informed about what the research says as we conduct our clinical practice, but it can be hard to stay um, on top of it. It can be hard to access research articles. It can be hard to find the time to read those articles. So I'm here to give you um, some updates on SM research that has been published within the past five years or so. This is definitely not an exhaustive presentation. Um, and there are lots of things that I could have included today that I didn't just, you know, sort of for the sake of time and to not overwhelm you. But what I really tried to do was um, choose some articles that as a clinician, I thought were particularly interesting and that sort of gave me ideas about things that might inform my clinical practice. So I hope that, um, you know, the information here is helpful for you all in the same way. So we're going to break um, these presentations or break the presentation down into um, sort of several areas. First, we'll talk a little bit about some research looking at the classification of selective mutism. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about assessment measures and then treatment, of course, and lastly, correlates and you know, things that are sort of related to SM. And of course, we'll have some time for questions. Um, as Caitlin said, feel free to ask questions through the Q&A feature of Zoom. And um, while you can wait until the end, you can also ask questions as we go. So first of all, classification. Um, this is a, a really new study just published um, last year in 2020. It was a meta-analysis looking at um, rates of other forms of anxiety in children with selective mutism as a way of better understanding the classification of SM as an anxiety disorder. So this study looked at 22 other SM research studies um, 
including a total of 837 um, children, and found that there was a 80% comorbidity rate between selective mutism and any other anxiety disorder. So 80% of the children in the study with SM also met criteria for another anxiety disorder. And you can see in the diagram here what the breakdown of that was. Um, not surprisingly, social anxiety disorder was most prevalent. Um, and we know that there is a very high rate of overlap between SM and social anxiety disorder. So I read this study and kind of read through the results and thought, okay, like, this is interesting. This makes sense to me. This is kind of about what I would expect. We know that when we look at anxiety disorders more broadly and aren't just focused on selective mutism, the comorbidity rate is about 80%. So 80% of kids with generalized anxiety disorder have an, another comorbid anxiety disorder. 80% of kids with social anxiety disorder have at least one other comorbidity. So this seems really consistent. And I interpreted this as like some, you know, reasonable evidence that, you know, anxiety is at the core of selective mutism. Very interestingly, the researchers um, interpreted the study differently. And what they said was, well, this leaves 20% of kids for whom SM can't be explained by anxiety because they don't meet criteria for another anxiety disorder. And that actually should lead us to rethink the um, conceptualization of SM as being purely anxiety-based, um, which I thought was a big leap. So um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about why I think that um, jump may be premature. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that there are many kids at least with whom I work clinically, who I only do diagnose with selective mutism, but they have many other anxiety features at a subclinical level. And um, if you bear with me, I'll read you a um, de-identified passage from a recent um, evaluation report that I wrote for a child with selective mutism. Um, so this says, Parents further reported a range of lower intensity fears and worries that suggest Jack, a pseudonym, may have a more sensitive temperament and a proclivity to experience anxiety broadly beyond his distress in speaking in social situations. To that end, they described a mild fear of dogs, a newly emerged fear of shots, some sensitivity to loud noises, a historical, historical fear of going in the water to swim, and a love-hate relationship with costume characters at amusement parks, showing interest from afar, but being hesitant to get too close. They also noted that he frequently asks questions about the schedule, gets frustrated if he can't execute on a plan in his mind, and worries about getting in trouble. He's also very particular about his morning routine. So there is a lot going on with this kid, Jack, whose primary concern was SM. Um, but all of these kind of little fears were mild enough that the parents said, no, they're not really causing a lot of interference, you know, or his fear of costume characters comes up so infrequently that it's, you know, really not a big deal. Um, and in my clinic, we use what's called the anxiety disorders interview schedule to um, make diagnoses as we, as we do assessments. And this is really the gold standard anxiety disorder um, evaluation uh, measure. And it requires for a diagnosis, a severity rating. So a, a level of distress and a level of interference around something that's anxiety provoking to be above a four on a zero to eight point scale. And so in this example, Jack's parents reported lots of fears, but they were really all at a subclinical level, kind of twos and threes where they came up, he might cry, he might get upset, but then they could go on their day. But there were a lot of them and they didn't meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. So it's so kind of a long-winded way of saying that um, not all kids with SM will have a diagnosable anxiety comorbidity, um, but many who don't have another disorder may still have lots of kind of subclinical manifestations or vulnerabilities to anxiety. That being said, there probably is a small, um, smaller subset of kids who might just have selective mutism and that you know, may not experience many other forms of anxiety, just like 
there are some kids who only have specific phobias and don't experience lots of other forms of anxiety, or some kids who only have separation anxiety and don't experience other forms of anxiety. So I am kind of presenting this study and to sh uh, show you that the rate of anxiety overlap when we talk about diagnosis rates is high. And from my perspective as a clinician, the actual rate of anxiety in kids with SM is probably even higher. Um, but I encourage you all to look at this article and kind of draw your own conclusions. It was really interesting and surprising for me. But as we kind of move on, and if we assume that anxiety is at the core of selective mutism, well, what are children with selective mutism afraid of? So in this 2019 study um, was a large internet based study that um, in this kind of particular portion of it had 35 respondents, um, all youth with selective mutism. And they were asked both open-ended and closed-ended questions about what is the content of your fear in situations in which you're expected to speak, but in which you're not able to speak. So here are what the responses looked like. Unsurprisingly, given again what we know about this overlap between SM and social anxiety, um, the highest rate of endorsed fears had to do with social, eval social evaluation or social interaction in some form. Um, some of that was being negatively evaluated by others or kind of being criticized or teased by others. Some of it, um, interestingly, was about just having to interact with someone else. Like, I'm scared of saying hi, because that means I might have to have a conversation. Um, some of it were, was fears about being observed and being the center of attention. Um, but this wasn't the only category of response. The second um, most endorsed set of fears were related to making mistakes. Um, so there was a kind of element of perfectionism in their responses, being afraid of giving an incorrect response or saying something wrong. Um, or you know, deviating from the norm. So those two categories made up the sort of largest group of fears in children with SM. Um, but there were some kids who reported language-based fears um, and others who interesting, interestingly reported voice-based fears. So this was the smallest group, but um, fears of one's voice actually sounding funny or weird um, or you know, things like that. So um, we see that there are kind of many kind of cognitions that go along with selective mutism and especially, and this sample included kids between the ages of eight and 18. So they were slightly older than many of the kids who first present in many of our clinics. Um, but they're kind of identifying why they're scared of speaking. Other things that came up in this study were what the researchers termed fear-related aspects. So kind of cognitive um, processes that were interfering with the um, individual's ability, ability to speak because they were overly focused on their anxiety symptoms they felt in their body. So they were thinking about their heart beating fast or there being a feeling of a lump in their throat, or they were thinking about their thoughts, meaning that they were or, um, ruminating or excessively rehearsing what they were going to say, or they experienced just kind of an overwhelming sense of anxiety and they felt paralyzed and their mind felt empty. Um, so I think this study is really interesting because it does include kids that are slightly older than many of our SM studies. And at an older age, I think kids have more insight into their kind of thought processes and experiences. And this gives us a sense of, you know, why speaking may be hard. And from a clinical perspective, if we know why speaking is hard for a child, that helps us better treat um, that child. When we think about um, helping them you know, practice facing fears, practice speaking in different situations, we might approach that very differently if we know that every time they're in a speaking situation, they all they can focus on is the fact that their heart is beating versus if every time they're in a speaking situation, they're worried that they are going to um, say the wrong thing and make a mistake. Um, so I thought this study was really nice and kind of the first one of its kind to give us some insight into you know, some of the, the thoughts and cognitive um, processes of kids and 
adolescence in this case with selective mutism. Right, so that moves us into talking a little bit about SM assessment and what are some updates in this area. So there are kind of two validated um, questionnaires to assess SM. Many of you are probably familiar with the selective mutism questionnaire. Um, it's been around um, the longest at this point and it is fairly widely used, but it's not the only kid on the block. Um, some um, German SM researchers recently published the Frankfurt Scale of Selective Mutism. Um, so we have some options now and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about each of these measures. So first off, the, the SMQ or Selective Mutism Questionnaire, um, this is just a little sample of what the scale looks like that I figured I would include here um, in case anyone wasn't familiar with it. But it's broken into um, three categories and parents rate how frequently a child speaks in each of um, you know, those categories in, in response to these prompts. So speech at school, speech at home and in family settings, and then speech in kind of social situations or in the community. Um, and then there also are several items about distress and interference. So how much of a problem is that the child isn't speaking and how distressed are both the child and the parents. Um, so the SMQ is pretty good at measuring change, um, meaning that it can you know, show growth in kids as they kind of go through treatment, for example. However, one of the things that the SMQ has been criticized for is that there are no cutoff scales. So there's no kind of um, direct way of interpreting a score on the SMQ kind of in isolation. There are no standard scores that you can say, okay, so this child got a score of two, so that means they're in the clinical range or they're in the subclinical range or in their, they're in the average range. Um, so our back and, and colleagues, along with Lindsay Bergman, who is the original author of the SMQ, um, recently published this paper, giving clinicians and researchers both some more guidance about interpreting the SMQ and the use of the SMQ. So this little kind of um, snapshot that I, I pulled directly from the study is a table of several SM um, treatment studies that used the SMQ and the means of children at baseline, um, so before treatment in those samples. And so what you can kind of see uh, across these scales, the, the school scale, the home scale, the public scale, the, the total scale, is that like across studies, these numbers are, are pretty consistent. You know, there's a, a little bit of, of variability, but you know, all of these kids with selective mutism are, are sort of scoring in the, the same general range. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the SMQ, um, it is scored on a zero to three scale. So each of the um, sections, the all of the responses get added and um, an average score is, is derived. And lower scores mean less speech. Um, so that's one of the things that, about the SMQ that sometimes is confusing for clinicians, because often when we're looking at something like the child behavior checklist or other um, you know, symptom measures, higher scores are problematic. They mean you know, more anxiety, more inattention, more disruptive behavior. On the SMQ, higher scores reflect more speaking. So the higher the score, the better. The lowest score you can get is zero. The highest score you can get is three. A three means that this child is almost always speaking in that situation. A zero means a child is never speaking in that situation. So kids with SM you know, look like they speak more at home, um, given that you know, these numbers and the um, home column are a little bit higher. But they, um, I'm going to try to spotlight that for you. There you go. The home column or home row, I should say, are a little bit higher. Um, but you know, in total, they are their scores are below um, below one, meaning that they are never to seldom speaking in most other situations. So this is interesting. Um, it gives us a, you know a little bit more guidance about when you have a child in your office and you give them the SMQ and they get a, a total score of 0.72 or 1.06, like, you know, how you can interpret that, what does, you know, that mean compared to other children with selective mutism. But it's also helpful to know 
what a, an SMQ score means compared to kids who are typically developing, who don't have selective mutism. So that's what these researchers looked at. They had a, a sample of 64 kids, so it's not a, a huge sample, um, half with SM. And one of the strengths of the study is that the um, TD, typically developing controls, were matched on several variables, age, gender, um, ethnicity and language status, so whether or not a child was bilingual, and parental education. So they really tried to get these samples, you know, as close to each other as, you know, as they could, other than the selective mutism. And they had both the kids with SM and the controls complete the SMQ at three time points. And there was a baseline time point. Then the kids with SM got treatment, and so there was a post-treatment, or, you know, six months later for the control time point. And then a year after that, so 18 months after baseline. And this is what the results were. So first thing is this red line is the typically developing kids. So the kids without anxiety, without selective mutism. Um, across all three time points, you can see that this line is pretty straight. So there was not a lot of change in their speaking just due to the passage of time. And you know this score up here, um, the red line is at, at 2.5. So that means across time points in these different, in different speaking situations, kids were often to almost always speaking. Um, the story looks very different when you look at the blue line though, the line for kids with selective mutism. So at their baseline, they're below one, which is um, consistent with the previous slide. They improve significantly with treatment. This um, is a clinically and statistically significant um, difference from baseline to six months. Um, this is from six months to 18 months is not a statistically significant difference. So it's really considered like a maintenance of gains. So we know that on the SMQ, typically developing kids, their speech patterns don't change. Um, and even with treatment, their speech tends to stay higher than that of kids with selective mutism. So this you know, tells us something about using the SMQ, helps us interpret it more. It also tells us something about our treatments. And even when we have treatments that are leading to significant gains, there still might be some work to do there um, to get our kids with SM to a place where they are closer to their typically developing peers. Uh, but as I said, the SMQ, it's not the only kid on the block, so to speak. Um, there also is the newly released FSSM, Franklin Scales of Selective Mutism. So um, this measure really has, um, I think, was intended to have more clinical utility than the, the SMQ, which is great for research studies, great at measuring change, but not great at really understanding kind of like what does a score tell us about a, a specific child. Um, so what the FSSM um, tried to do was number one, um, include a diagnostic scale. So there were 10 questions focusing on core SM symptoms um, and the psychometrics suggest that if a child scores above a certain, um, certain level on the diagnostic scale, you can be fairly confident that they would meet criteria for selective mutism. Um, this scale also was shown to differentiate between kids with SM and with social anxiety disorder, which I think is helpful clinically, again, given you know, the overlap I've mentioned a few times. So then in addition to the diagnostic scale, there is the severity scale. So the um, F SSM, <laughs> those letters just don't roll off the tongue easily, um, maintains the same three domains as the SMQ, school, family, and social, and um, allows for you know, the respondent to describe speaking patterns in each of those areas. Um, so that's helpful clinically. But then what's I think also really nice about this measure is that there are three versions. Um, as you can see, kind of early childhood, elementary school age, and then you know, teen, one for teens and tweens, which you know, as we know, um, SM is not just a problem for um, young children, despite what you know, re the research has historically um, told us. And so I think that it, it's really great that this scale is 
offering um, kind of a developmentally appropriate and kind of developmentally focused assessment. Because um, one of the things about the SMQ is that um, it was not necessarily intended for use in adolescence. I think that the kind of early samples were, you know, maybe three to eight or nine. Um, and it includes items like how much does your child speak to a babysitter, which obviously wouldn't be relevant for a 15 or 16 year old. Um, so I think the SMQ is great. It's something that I use a lot clinically. And I think that it is exciting from both a clinical and a research perspective to um, have some options and you know, think about some different ways that we might include measures of um, you know, parent report FM features. All right, so with that uh, discussion of assessment, of course, that brings us into treatment, yeah, next. Um, as we talk about treatment, I wanted to um, kind of quickly note the kind of APA guidelines around evidence-based practice. So, you know, there are these three overlapping circles and each of us are going to bring our own clinical experiences and expertise. Each patient who comes into our office is going to come with their own characteristics and preferences. So, you know, those bottom two circles will look a little bit different for all of us. But the top circle, the best available research evidence, um, that's what I'm going to kind of talk about today and you know, kind of what might, is, might be consistent across SM treatments. So I want to start by talking about um, this review article that came out right about five years ago, um, Reinforce, Shape, Expose, and Fade. <laughs> so the researchers um, identified 21 articles um, published between 2005 and 2015 that were SM treatment outcome studies of some form. Um, so this included group design studies, this included case studies, this included single case designs. So there was a lot of kind of variability in the methodology of the studies that they included. But what they started by doing was looking at what um, treatments are you know, kind of even being offered and, and published on um, when we talk about selective mutism. So you can, you can kind of get a sense of that here, that the largest group of studies were what they called um, treatment approaches that combined behavioral um, interventions and systems interventions. So interventions that um, involved parents, interventions that involved schools. So that's this red bar. Um, the second biggest group were behavioral only interventions. You may see and be kind of wondering, well, you have this green box down at the bottom that says psychodynamic, but I don't see a green bar on the chart. What happens there? Um, and that's because even though the researchers were coding for psychodynamic approaches, um, there were no studies that were purely psychodynamic. There was one that included some psychodynamic play therapy components in addition to behavioral and systems interventions. Um, but zero purely psychodynamic treatment. So um, the two biggest groups here, the things that are most represented in the literature are behavioral and behavioral plus systems. So what exactly does that mean? So um, the researchers then looked at the behavioral treatment components. And um, coded each study um, to describe what interventions were you know, actually being offered. <laughs> so um, this chart will kind of show you some of that, that contingency management, um, so rewards, positive reinforcement was the um, behavioral component most frequently cited, followed by shaping, gradual exposure, and fading. Um, in this other category here, this included a kind of a, a number of, of different things that were really only included in like two to three studies, things like role plays, things like social skills training, um, among others. So this gives you a sense of what behavioral interventions were being used. Um, and then I wanted to also think about well, what systems interventions are being used because that, um, category was pretty high as well. And the system treatment that was kind of most commonly included 
was parents in treatment, um, which when I think about it, I don't necessarily think of that as something that is separate from behavioral treatment, but I suppose um, that if you think about you know, kind of systems as being the sort of environment um, around a, a child and a child's interactions with um, you know, different, different people and in different settings, then I could see that. So we have parent involvement, school involvement, um, skills training specifically meant skills training of parents. Um, so it was a little bit different of just having parents involved versus actually teaching parents strategies for responding to their child's um, at them. Psychoeducation also was psychoeducation for parents. Um, so the article, uh, uh, or the, rather the title of this article was called Reinforce, Shape, Expose, and Fade. And I added this and include parents, since that really was a big component of many treatments. Um, so that tells us a little bit about kind of what treatments are out there, at least pre, you know, 2016, 2017. Um, but it doesn't tell us a lot about treatment outcomes. So that's what I want to talk about next. So this um, table lists the to my knowledge, only five um, selection mutism randomized control trials, and then also two open trials that um, I wanted to include because A, they have been published more recently, and B, down at the bottom here, you'll see that the social communication anxiety treatment and parent-child interaction therapy are um, two treatments that I, I think that um, often get a lot of attention, um, at least more recently in the, the SM um kind of world and, and community so these are kind of the, the studies what do we know about them um first i thought it would be interesting to think about okay so we have all you know these different treatments that you know we have studied at this point um what are the components of them so this chart tells you that. Um, and one of the things that you know, I think you'll see is that for many of these studies um, that were, you know, only two of these were included in that review paper I just talked about, but they all included a lot of the same interventions. So shaping and fading, gradual exposure, rewards and contingency management. Um, some of you may be wondering why the Esposito column is, or row rather, <laughs> um, is left blank. And this was a, um, an RCT that came out of Italy that used um, what I understand is a, a common European intervention called psychomotricity. And to be completely honest, despite reading the article, I didn't feel like I had a great um, understanding of what the different components involved were. Um, so I didn't want to kind of take my best guesses and, and try to, to break it down um, and kind of put things into these categories when I wasn't completely sure. But um, one of the things that you can, I wanna call your attention to um, in this chart is the parent involvement column. So, you know, the Esposito study excluded, there was only one other RCT that didn't involve parents. And so I just want you to note that for a second because I'm going to show you some outcomes. This is a slide with a lot going on. Um, so I'll kind of walk you through some of it. And some of it, you know, these slides will be available for you to review so you can read through some of it on your own. But if you look at the first column, the first column um, gives just kind of a, a quick summary of treatment outcomes of the previously mentioned studies based on the use of the SMQ or the SSQ, which I didn't mention previously, but is the school speech questionnaire, which was um, derived from the SMQ for teachers to provide um, their assessment of a child's speech in the classroom. So in each of these studies, except the one circled, there were statistically significant um, gains based on these measures. Um, except in the one study where there was no parent involvement. Um, this study was entirely clinician and um, child-based. And I think parents were kind of given a brief check-in at the end of every session to, um, and we're told, oh, you know, this is what we talked about in two or three minutes. 
but there was no parent training, there was no parent involvement in doing exposures, there was no parent involvement in giving rewards in any kind of systematic way. And this was the one study where there were no significant gains in speaking. So that's interesting. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just one study and all of these studies are kind of hampered by some of the same challenges and limitations as far as things like sample size um, being relatively small. Um, but yeah, it is notable. So I'm going to kind of skip ahead to the next slide to talk a little bit more about um, treatment outcome in a, a more systematic way. Um, and share the results of a recent meta-analysis with you. And I think at the very beginning of this talk, I mentioned that, you know, there's new research that's coming out all the time. It's hard to stay on top of it. So I had started working on this presentation um, back in June and had kind of gotten most of the articles together that I want, wanted to talk about. And then two weeks ago, actually not even two weeks ago, I'm pretty sure it was last week, I popped onto PsychInfo, which is a kind of, you know, search engine for um, psychological research studies. And suddenly this article was there that I hadn't seen previously because it was literally just published in July of 2021. Um, so I'm glad that I found it because it fits perfectly into this talk. And, you know, I kind of left um, because it is you know, kind of a perfect example of how new stuff is coming out all of the time. So this research group looked at the, the five selective mutism RCTs and did a meta-analysis meta of them um, to determine, you know, kind of overall how effective is treatment for SM. And the treatment in all of these studies were categorized as kind of that combination of behavioral and systems. And so I have this arrow down here, which is not doing a great job of pointing to the overall G, um, which is kind of the, the summary statistic. And if you all are, are anything like me, you might look at that and say, hmm, hedge is G. I think a 0 0.87 maybe is a good thing, but um, I don't remember my statistics from grad school. So what does that mean? So hedge is G is a measure of effect size. And effect size tells us um, the degree of what is called practical significance of the findings, right? So um, we talk about, you know, things like p-values that tell us statistical significance, um, but effect size tells us, like, is this a meaningful difference, like, in real life? Um, and effect sizes, you know, are categorized into three groups of so small, medium, and large. So an effect size of 0 0.87 is considered a large effect size. So that means that across these five RCTs, um, which typically compared some kind of behavioral treatment for selective mutism with um, a weightless control, although one of them did use kind of an attention-based control, um, there was a meaningful difference between the kids who received treatment and the kids who didn't. So we, and that difference was you know, not just meaningful, it was a large difference. So we know that kids who get, who were involved in these treatments tended to get um, better than kids who were in the control groups and did not receive treatment. So, you know, that's exciting. We're, you know, seeing um, some summary statistics that tell us treatments are effective. We're seeing individual studies. Um, you know, so what do we take from this? Does this mean that, oh, I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, yellow box, there we go. Does this mean um, that we have you know, some well-validated um, empirically supported for treatment treatments for selective mutism at this point? Um, but unfortunately, the answer is that there are none, um, despite all of these studies I just told you about. And why is that? So if we look at you know, APA criteria for empirically validated treatments to be considered a well-established treatment. So that is, those are the treatments with the highest level of research support. We need at least two studies with group designs that show that the treatment is either superior to a pill, a psychological placebo, or another treatment. 
um, or that that treatment is equivalent to an already established treatment. And none of our SM studies do that yet. So we can't say that they're well-established. We can, though, say that they are probably efficacious. So we have more than two studies, multiple studies at this point, that show that these treatments are more effective than a weightless control group. Um, so that's great. We know that doing something, um, you know, some of what we as a community doing are doing is better than doing nothing. Um, but you know, we still have some ways to go. Um, so for you know all of you potential clinician researchers out there, there's kind of you know room for more um, SM treatment studies. The other thing is, you know, we kind of have if I flip back a little bit. You know, these different kind of treatment packages, integrated behavioral therapy, to focus communication and behavioral techniques, um, parent-child interaction therapy for selective mutism, SCAT. And um, there are differences in that. You know, this chart shows some of them, but even just in the way concepts are, are presented and, and skills are, are focused on, there are differences. But yet at their core, they may be more similar than they are different, um, which is great. But we also don't know which of these is best or if any of them is best at this point. And it may be that some of these different approaches are best for different individuals depending on individual characteristics. Um, but we don't have that information yet. So we have some ways to go in continuing to refine our treatments and um, kind of get us to that point. So I'm going to skip back ahead and um, move on from treatments to talk a little bit about SM correlates. So one of the things I wanted to highlight were predictors of treatment response in these studies. <laughs> and what some of you may be noticing is, wait a second, why is age in both columns? Is age a significant predictor of response or is it not? And it depends on which study you're looking at. <laughs> it was um, a significant response in Arabex study, um, but not in Catchpole's PCIT for SM study. So um, maybe younger kids have a better treatment response, or maybe it depends on the specific treatment package that they're getting. And some are, um, treatments are better suited for younger kids than older kids. Um, in studies that looked at predictors, one thing that was kind of consistent across was that initial symptom severity was a significant predictor. So kids with more severe SM symptoms at pretreatment um, showed fewer gains. Um, family compliance was a significant predictor in the SCAT study. So families that did a better job doing their homework and practicing skills at home showed greater gains. And one study showed that a family history of SM led to worse outcomes. Um, some studies, some predictors that were not significant were language skills, how long a child had SM, which in some ways is kind of correlated with age, and then other comorbid diagnoses. So again, there's some work to do here. We have some inconsistencies um, that it's interesting to you know, think about who may have a better response to treatment and um, you know, who may make slower progress. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about, which isn't exactly a, a correlate of SM, but a study that I found interesting is um, this one that looked at um, what characteristics people, places, and activities were described as most anxiety provoking for children with SM. And this was based on parent reports. Um, I wanna say that there were a little under a hundred parents in this sample, but I could be misremembering that number. Um, and so they had parents report on people related characteristics. So um, kids, generally had a harder time with people who kind of got too close or put too much pressure on the child to speak, people who showed authority characteristics, um, people who were new, and um, you know, some other categories here. In the, the place group, um, kids most commonly had trouble speaking in new places um, and in crowded places. You know, makes sense to me based on my clinical experience. 
But again, there were some other things reported, places with negative experiences, so places where they've had a hard time speaking in the past. Um, that um, also is not surprising to me because we sometimes talk, even though it's like kind of an icky word about contaminated places, places where kids have had sort of failed speaking attempts and then it's harder to, to speak there again. Um, and things that might make situations harder, um, new activities, being concerned about failing, being the focus of attention. Um, so I encourage you to kind of check out the study because I thought it was really interesting. And you're kind of tying back to what I was saying at the beginning about what we know about the content of SM fears and how that can help us guide treatment. I think having an understanding of um, aspects of situations that make them difficult for a child um, with regard to speaking also helps us provide better intervention and helps us really target on, um, you know, practicing things that are hard for kids, whether it's, you know, talking in new places or talking while people are watching or whatever it might be. Um, so this was a, kind of another hot off the presses study just published earlier this year. And I think add something new to the SM literature. So with that, um, there's a long reference list here. Um, and I am going to pause because I'm sure there are some questions. Uh, thank you, first of all, Dr. Marston, for an awesome presentation. I know I personally like screenshotted so many of those slides, so I'm very grateful that we'll get the chance to um, see the recording um, afterwards so we can go and re-reference um, stuff. Um, so there was one question, um, but feel free for those of you who sort of were still thinking about your questions or formatting the best way to pose them um, to go ahead and submit those through the Q&A um, feature. Uh, the question was, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this was in reference to the, um, uh, the uh, Orbeck SMQ where they assessed six months and 18 months post. It was a question posed about what was the type of treatment provided um, in that analysis? Great question. I'll flip back to that slide and can talk about that. So the treatment um, provided to the, the kids in the SMQ condition was, um, heads, <laughs> sorry to make you guys dizzy, um, was what is kind of in the, the second row here, um, defocused communication and behavioral techniques. So defocused communication really refers to um, using some strategic kind of play and interaction therapies to get comfortable with a child and um, kind of help a child warm up to a new person. And then behavioral techniques are, you know, some of the things that we discussed, fading, shaping, reinforcement, exposure, et cetera. Um, so the, the data on, from that SMQ study actually comes from this 2014 clinical trial. And one of the things that I uh, didn't mention when talking about this study, um, which I think is a question that many people have, is, well, isn't this, aren't we missing something here? Are we missing an SM group that didn't get treatment? And what would we see if 18 months went by with kids with SM who didn't have any intervention, would there be any natural increases over time? Um, and you know, the answer is maybe, um, but what we know from shorter periods of time where kids with SM have not received treatment, kind of wait, um, waitlist periods of you know, somewhere in the, the one to three month or four month range is that there are generally no changes in SMQ scores of untreated kids with SM during shorter periods of time. From a research perspective, it wouldn't really be ethical to withhold treatment um, from kids with SM for that long just to see what happens. Um, so it's possible that there might be a, you know, a small increase as kids develop over time. But you know, what I would feel fairly confident saying is that at least from baseline to six months, you would see a pretty straight line. Great, thanks. There's also a question here. This is, I think, more of a, uh, a question looking for some additional resources. Um, a school-based professional with a student with selective mutism on the caseload, um, looking for you know, resources, assistance, um, suggestions for where to get started, um, specifically reference that the parents uh, don't see this as a problem, so won't be you know, pursuing um, private therapy for the child. Um, 
I can certainly chime in on some of this too, but I'll let you take it away first. The SMA, we have worked pretty hard to compile a number of resources that, that might be used uh, specifically for school-based professionals, but uh, yeah, Dr. Merston, go ahead and share your, some of your favorites. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, you know, I just want to say that I know that that is a, a really challenging position to be in as a, a school-based professional and, you know, seeing a child who is really struggling, wanting to do everything that you can to help and having parents who are, are not on the same page. Um, so as, you know, Caitlin mentioned, there are a number of resources through SMA. So if you haven't already checked out our um, toolkit for educators, um, I would encourage you to do that. And maybe that's something that we can put a link to in the chat if it's not there already. Um, I also really encourage you to attend the next webinar in September, September which is specifically for school-based professionals. Um, there are some books in our um, SMA library or, or online bookstore, I, I think it's called, um, on our website that are geared towards um, teachers and supporting kids at school. So I'd encourage you to check those out as well. Um, and then, you know, one thing that I, I would say about just kind of working with this child in the context of a, a family who isn't viewing this as a, a problem is that, um, you know, while on one hand, there is only so much that anyone can do in school. On the other hand, school is a place where kids spend like the majority of their awake time that they're not sleeping, um, at least in, you know, normal non-COVID times. Um, so if you can work to kind of support this child in the school environment and get him or her even speaking a little bit at school, um, even if, you know, the speech isn't being addressed in the community or, or anywhere else, that's still could lead to huge changes in the child's life. Um, and if I am kind of speaking with parents who don't necessarily have the same concerns I do, um, you know, I really always want to start by kind of empathizing with them and trying to you know, validate and understand their viewpoint. And um, I think it can be helpful to present sort of a, a curious stance as to, you know, just gathering some information from them about um, and what they think is going well for their child. And if they're not concerned about their child speaking, like, is there anything that um, their child is struggling with that um, they are concerned about? Maybe there's some other issue that is more pressing for them. Um, or maybe they just don't think this is a big deal. Um, so I've had some families who have, who's, um, you know, in whom the parents have SM histories and were very quiet when they were in school and they, you know, kind of outgrew it with time. And so there's a, a sense that their child might do the same thing. And so, you know, in those cases, I would, again, really validate the perspective of the parent and try to gently provide examples of how the child's lack of speech is getting in the way at school. Um, and, you know, if the parents aren't as concerned about the academic piece, then maybe it's an advocacy and safety issue, um, or maybe it's a, a social issue and you're seeing this as a, a child who is really kind of isolated um, and not engaged with peers. And that might be something that kind of the parents respond to more than the child not reading and reading group or participating in class. So kind of trying to figure out, you know, where is, is the hook and what is important to the family and using that as, you know, some leverage to get them to buy into some intervention. Um, awesome. There's been another question here with a, a really nice comment about um, thanking you, but also uh, posing the question of, of whether there's been some recent research with older youth or adults with selective mutism, if you know of anything that might be on the pipeline, um, if there's not anything um, in the works just yet. That is such a good question because there is such a need for that kind of research. Um, I don't know it very much, to be totally honest. Um, you know, I know that there are a few groups, um, particularly you know, in the US here in New York City, um, that do a lot of clinical work with adolescents with SM, but I don't know where they are as far as publishing any outcomes or treatment manuals or guidance for those populations, unfortunately. Me either. Um, question here, I think this is um, 
a little, having a little bit of a hard time following. Um, so I think what it, I think the question here is um, whether performance anxiety is considered a, like a, a separate specifier or subtype of social anxiety or selective mutism. Um, an example given here is that not only does the child not talk, but they also don't want to write in class mm -hmm. or you know demonstrate other sort of nonverbal behaviors. Absolutely, it is a great question, um, something that I see frequently. Um, when I think about kind of the overlap between selective mutism and social anxiety, I do think about um, anxiety in non-speaking, but kind of performative or, or public spheres as something that can differentiate the two and can be kind of an indicator to me that in addition to selective mutism, an additional social anxiety disorder diagnosis is warranted. Um, so I think that sometimes that kind of performance anxiety piece is coming from comorbid um, social anxiety. However, with regard to writing, um, one of the things that I have noticed with kids with SM is sometimes, even when they might not have other kind of forms of social anxiety, writing their ideas can still be really hard for them, um, almost because it, I think it feels like it's some type of you know, form of communication and it's kind of getting at the same endpoint as, um, as speaking is and still opens someone up to kind of potential judgment or um, embarrassment if they write the wrong thing or make a mistake when, while they're writing, kind of going back to those, that list of fears that I mentioned earlier with regard to um, kids with that SM. You know, I think a, a lot of that can, these things can come up in a, a written context in addition to a verbal or vocal context. Um, question about, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of smiling and laughing here, and I, this will be the last one, um, but uh, so it, we, I don't think we'll have time to do this full justice, but um, question about overlap with the autism spectrum, client who seems to exhibit both sets of symptoms. I'm, I'm smiling because this is a conversation that Rachel and I uh, were having just before the call went live. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's a, a great question. I mean, I think that the way that the, the DSM currently stands, and like, let's let's be honest, the DSM is certainly an imperfect document in, in many ways, um, is that technically children with SM and children with um, cannot be diagnosed with autism and that those are two kind of separate diagnoses. I think that most of us that um, have a kind of, good amount of clinical experience with kids with selective mutism know that that is not necessarily true and that there can be kids with both autism spectrum disorders and SM. And um, I think that one of the points of confusion is that obviously um, a defining feature of an autism spectrum disorder is that there are um, speech and language kind of delays and communication impairments. So one of the things that I will often think about to kind of make that differential or dual diagnosis is, does this child have kind of speech or communication impairments kind of across the board, across all settings? Is their speech at home the same as it is at school? And is it the same as it is when they're um, in a, a place with new people? Or do you see differences there? And is this a child who maybe meets criteria for ASD, can speak to whatever degree they are able to at home with their parents, but then has further impairment um, in speech or anxiety about speaking in other settings. So I think that there is um, room for um, dual diagnosis, I, despite the fact that the DSM says no, um, but I do see ASD and SM as two kind of separate um, disorders. Awesome, I think that's uh, in, in sort of a, an effort to stay punctual here. I think we should probably go ahead and um, wrap up for today. Thanks all for your questions. And uh, of course, again, a big thank you to Dr. Merson for a really wonderful presentation, succinctly summarizing um, a lot of studies and um, a lot of great information for us uh, as clinicians and certainly um, those who are researchers as well. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Caitlin, for moderating. And again, we appreciate um, all of your engagement and questions and attendance. Bye.